All right. Well, welcome everybody. I think we can officially begin. So thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Michelle Anderson. I am a founder of Clarinet Mentors and just a clarinetist in Vancouver, BC. I first of all really want to thank Mary Druhan, who is watching this for setting up this year um, the, the learning, clarinet learning community. That's what this is part of. Had this event been happening in person, as was originally planned, um, there would be six different levels from total beginners up to more advanced players. And um, this particular one, CLC level one, is mostly aimed at people who've been playing for about a year or less. However, I really have to say that a lot of the basics that we work on to have good habits as we start playing apply to more advanced players too. So I know some of you here are more advanced and I also want to say there's some incredible other workshops happening within the clarinet learning community. So check them out. Um, there's going to be some overlap because all of us probably plan to cover embouchure and in which is what I'm doing um, next week. I'm talking about articulation and then there's fingers the week after that and then high notes the week after that. But please do check out the other sessions. They're going to be relevant to you for sure. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to share as much information as I can on things that make your clarinet sound better and feel easier to play in the next 20 minutes or so. And then we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So um, the way, probably the easiest way for us to find your questions is to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, Nola is going to help draw them to my attention as we go. So I want to start with um, just embouchure, right? The shape of our mouth. And especially if you're a new clarinetist, Hopefully you, you have some sense of what works best, but I want to just cover the basics and show you some things that I found can make quite a difference right away for new players. So first of all, just to cover the very basics, um, I like to look at three main things when I'm just looking at beginning to how we shape embouchure. Probably the most important part initially is what we do with our bottom lip and chin. Our clarinet reed, when we blow air across it, actually vibrates open and shut. And our goal is to get it vibrating as much as it can. The more the reed vibrates, the more resonance and tone we get. So it hits our bottom lip and chin. And we wanna try and have a surface there that's very smooth and flat and um, doesn't put a lot of blob on the reed. And one of the ways I like to teach people how to do that is to say, first of all, if you're looking in a mirror or you can see yourself, we want just the edge of our bottom lip over our teeth so we can still kind of see the pink part. So one way of doing it, and you can all try this, is take a finger, just put the edge of your lip over your teeth, hold it in. With your other hand, we want to pull everything else down. So I'm going to anchor my lip first and then pull it all down. The reason I want to pull it down is that gets rid of the loose blob that could muffle the reed. And I challenge you, it's so easy, whatever device you're watching me on, you can probably make a video recording of yourself or take a photo, turn sideways and look at this shape. We wanna see it curved in. And sometimes our muscles literally don't know how to do that. You'll, you'll sort of pull it down and it'll go, boing. <laughs> it'll spring back up to loose. We need to train it to do that. So even without your clarinet, you can kind of walk around pulling it, looking in the mirror, trying to hold this shape. And our muscles learn really quickly. It might take a while to build strength, but that's really important for the read. So that's step one. Step two, and this is one that can make a big difference to your playing, is to sort of put the optimal amount of read and mouthpiece into your mouth, right? I mentioned that the read vibrates a lot. A lot of us have a habit of slipping our teeth and lip really close to the tip of the mouthpiece. So let's say if my bottom lip is here, and by the way, I'm using a synthetic reed, so it's kind of hard to see. I'm only leaving a teeny bit of the reed to vibrate. If I put more in my mouth, more reed can vibrate. And every mouthpiece is a bit different, so I can't tell you to be exactly eight sixteenths of an inch, but you have to figure out what it is. Um, here's a guideline. If you turn your mouthpiece sideways and hold it up to light, you'll notice there's space between the reed and the mouthpiece and eventually they touch. On my mouthpiece, it's right about here. If you put your finger on that spot, carry it to the back of the mouthpiece, that's about the ideal space for your top teeth to go. And a simple test is take a note. I can take our open G, that's the nickname for all the holes are open, and play it and just put a little bit more mouthpiece in. And there's a point we reach where 
it's our ideal point, and if we cross it, we usually squeak. So be aware the mouthpiece gets bigger. So as we're sliding in and out, sometimes we need to open our mouth a bit. But here's how this would look. I'm going to try and keep everything the same except for how much mouthpiece I have and see if you hear a difference. <laughs> so it was very obvious when I went too far. Not sure how much you can hear through Zoom, but in this room, they all were G's until I squeaked. But as I put more in, I got more warmth, more sound, sounded louder, even though I wasn't blowing louder. That's an easy thing for you to experiment. Um, most people put their top teeth right on top of their mouthpiece. And I do recommend to have a mouthpiece patch. They're really inexpensive. Lots of um, clarinet companies make them, makes it a little more comfortable. And you can also, um, have a either either take two patches and cut out a groove where you want your teeth to go to train them to be in that spot. I think Silverstein makes a patch that has a groove in it, but once you find that ideal spot, you want to do that. You can also do what's called double lip embouchure, where your top teeth, your top lip goes over your top teeth. That has some advantages as well. They're both good clarinet systems. Either one's going to work. So step one, we're pulling our bottom lip down. Step two, we have enough mouthpiece and reed in our mouth. Step three is more advanced but really important and I think a beginner can learn this right away. We want the whole side of our face and corners of our mouth to come inward like this and in doing so um, it does two things. It really allows the reed to vibrate well. I find it gives me warmer sound when we start playing more high notes and some of you are more advanced you're probably doing a lot of high notes. It warms up the sound but also um, as new clarinetists, we often squeak a lot. Well, I still squeak from time to time. It's not just a new clarinet problem, but we all have a habit when something is tough to, to be determined. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And that shows up as physical tension in our body. And one place we're really tense just naturally is our jaw <clears throat> comes down and munches on the reed. And that's one of the biggest causes of squeaks on clarinet. So if you hear, hear yourself squeaking, it might be a reminder that, oh, I've, <clears throat> I was trying too hard there. And sometimes there's a hard spot in the music and we know it's hard. It's like a red alert goes up in our brain. Woo, woo, hard spot. And that's when our jaw tightens. When we give attention to corners in, um, it helps counteract that jaw tension. So I have a simple little exercise that helps give you the feeling for that. You take a pencil. If you have a pencil nearby, grab one right now. What I'm going to do is put the eraser end in my mouth. I'm not going to put it between my teeth. I'm going to put it in front of my teeth. To do this, I might have to stick my lips out a little bit, kind of like a chimpanzee. And I'm going to hold the eraser in my mouth and move my head around and try not to have it fall out. So my lips sticking out are not going to look like clarinet lips, but what it does to the whole sides of my face and corners is the feeling I want. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> feels really silly. You can get into it as much as you want. But when I do this for about a full minute, I can actually start to feel some muscles in the corner of my mouth feeling a bit sore. So another exercise you can do without your clarinet that really helps give you this feeling. Of course, when we're playing clarinet, our bottom lip will be tucked in, as I said, but that corners in is the motion we want to have. So that's what I'm going to say about embouchure. Um, big important thing that can make a huge difference is how you hold your head and how you hold your clarinet and whether you're a new player or more advanced i want you to check on this when we're new to clarinet we want to it's just human nature we want to look down and see what our fingers are doing so we even as i'm talking with my head down it's tricky we want to put our head down really important you train yourself to have your head straight forward as if you're having a conversation with me so right now i'm looking at you saying hi how are you doing I want the clarinet to come to me with no head down. Again, I said earlier, please record yourself on video. Check that out and do it from the side. Because a lot of people think their head's up, but when they go to play, head down. And that can make a huge difference. Listen to what happens to my sound. I'll turn sideways so you can really see it as I go from head up to head down. makes a big difference. And again, if you're trying to make high notes, which are more sensitive, sometimes they won't even play 
if our head is too far down. Related to that, once we have our head up, the angle we hold our clarinet at makes quite an impact on how easy it is to play and what our sound is. And it's different for every person, the ideal angle, because all of us have different shaped jaws. But a simple test, again, is maybe start with your clarinet really far in. I know this is too far in. And then just hold it out and see where it sounds best. You can hear, probably even through Zoom, you can hear that I fuzzed out near the end there. So for me, it's right around here. A little different for everyone, but do find out, because especially those of you slightly more advanced in the high register, huge difference. You can really hear it out there. I'm going to keep this mostly for beginners, but for all of us, that's important. All right. Just quickly want to talk about reeds for new players. There's so much we could talk about reeds, but I will say a couple things. Here is my mouthpiece. It's really important that you position your reed so that the little hole is completely covered. Sometimes we're in a hurry and we move it a little bit crooked, a little too low, and it's not there. So do make sure you're always sort of checking that. Um, and if you have a cane reed, it's a little bit more flexible. If you're playing on synthetic reeds, um, I play on the Legere European cut. The, the synthetic reeds are really picky about being adjusted just right. You pretty well have to have it centered even. On a synthetic reed, you tighten your ligature really snugly. On a cane reed, usually our, if, if it's two screw ligature, usually the top screw is just enough so that it's not tight and the bottom screw a little bit tighter. And, but cane reeds like a little bit of a lighter touch. You have to experiment with that. Most people as beginners will start on a relatively um, soft reed, we call it, one that can move without a whole lot of air behind it. And that's great to help us get going. That's usually a one and a half or a two. However, very quickly, if you have good embouchure and especially good fast air, um, you're gonna want a reed that gives you a little bit more strength. So, uh, it's a little bit tricky when you're new to know, well, what would that be? But as a reed starts to get too soft for you, um, it will sound a little bit thin and buzzy. And when you start trying to play high notes and they wimp out, that's kind of a good sign. So my, you know, rough rule of thumb, it's different for everybody, but most players, if they're thinking of good habits with air and embouchure, need to be on at least a two and a half after about their first three months of playing. This is very, estimate but if you've been playing on a one and a half or two for a year or so i definitely encourage you to try going up a half strength and just to see how it works you might actually find you get more sound and that it sounds easier um i'm just going to take a quick glance at yeah just very quickly um gary or gary mentioned what's double embouchure yeah double lip embouchure gary i think is what you mean that's where our top lip goes a little bit over our top teeth as well okay um that kind of covers embouchure and all right the other questions that are here i'm going to get to at the end so i'm going to carry on just a little bit here um with air so air is like the fuel for clarinet everything that we do to make a good sound is related to how we blow and even if you're a brand new player it really helps you to have air in mind and so there's a couple things related to air um First of all, how we take air in is really important. Most of us in our everyday life activities don't have to think about really filling up with lots of air, but that's handy when we're playing clarinet. And um, many times, especially when I go into a classroom of kids, if I'll say, take a deep breath, I'll see them do something like this. <gasps> so there's two things I really don't like about what I'm doing right now. One is that I've just filled my shoulders up with virtual air. But there's actually no no air pockets in our shoulders. There shouldn't be, at least. In in tightening up our shoulders like this, we create a lot of tension here that's bad for our clarinet playing. Um, so the second thing is you could hear that tension in my throat. <gasps> if we can hear our air, we probably have excess tension. So we really want to think about the upper part of our body, our, our spines holding us up straight, being really loose. If you feel any shoulder tension, <sighs> try and relax it. When I breathe in, regardless of where my lungs actually are, I want to imagine I have a swim ring around my waist and that's what I'm filling up. I want to imagine I'm filling up low 
and all around. So if you were just to take a slow, deep breath without really hearing it in your throat, more of a very open, you could put your hands on your waist and just try and fill that up. And that can be great practice. Just practice breathing in deep breaths where you're expanding your ribs or put your hands on your ribs and feel how they like to, to pull out when we're inflating. So how we breathe in is important. I, I often do warm up exercises, breathing in for like four full beats. I'll just kind of think one, you know, fill up to here, or maybe start at the bottom, filling up here and then gradually filling up to the top till I'm full of air and then blowing it all out in four beats. What's really important is how we blow our air out. I could take in a huge amount of air and kind of do something like this. And like all my air just fell out, plop onto the ground. And I had a huge amount of air. It's gone in three seconds or less. For clarinet, we want to be able to play a lot, right? We want it to be fast and steady. And so um, there are some things we can do to help us with that. Even as beginners, it makes our life a lot easier if we have fast, steady air. So uh, imagine you could see the air coming out of your mouth, like water coming out of a hose. If I have a spray valve on my hose and I set it to that really misty, fine spray, that would be the equivalent of my air going, <sighs> this really slow, <sighs> wet, moist sound. That's not what we want for clarinet. Remember, we want our reed to vibrate like crazy. Our reed needs power wash air. Set the spray valve to the most focused, fastest airstream we can. Some of that we do with embouchure, but a lot of that, most of that's our blowing muscles. And a really simple exercise to help you get the feel is grab a piece of paper. If you have one handy, do it right now. Hold it at arm's length. And just, just to kind of notice what fast air feels like, you could start by just taking little bursts of air and trying to move the paper. Now that's not how I play clarinet with bursts of air, but it sort of lets me notice what powerful air sounds like and what it does. And you could probably, I'm a few feet from my mic, my guess is you could hear my air. There's, this is what fast air sounds like. This is what slow air sounds like. Even if you can hear them both, there's a difference. So this, this helps get us kind of noticing what that fast air is like. When we play clarinet, we want it to be fast and steady. So I do like doing the bursts of air to kind of notice what muscles am I activating? And I'll throw in a more advanced concept that had me more time, I would do even more. When we play clarinet, most of us, although there are different ways of achieving this, so I'm not saying this is the way, but I encourage you to experiment with it. If we take the muscles uh, under our ribs, sort of our lower abs around our belly button and push them out at the same time we blow, that sounds counterintuitive. I'm pushing out while I'm blowing. Watch my hand here. I actually get faster air. So I love doing this exercise with a hand on my abs. So here's my abs without blowing, just pushing out. I do that when I'm doing the bursts of air. The bursts give me the feel. Then I morph into, okay, you can do it with your hand in front of your face if you don't have paper. Just holding it steady. That's going to help us. So when I take my open G, I could put my hand on my abs and just try blowing that fast air. Fast air gives us clear sound. That slow air gives us this kind of sound. I am making sound, but there's kind of a whispery, airy sound in the background. If you ever have that whispery, airy sound, it means we want faster air. When we're new to clarinet, uh, and in fact, even when we're not new, because I still have to be mindful of this, um, there are certain things our body is conditioned to do that it tries to do on clarinet that makes clarinet harder. We speak a lot. We all, most of us know how to speak. When we speak, we inflect syllables with air. Otherwise, I would be talking like this and it would be very boring. So our body associates different sound with different kind of air. And how that translates onto clarinet, when we first start, as I add fingers, my air likes to change. And 
usually what most brains will do is say, oh, new note, let's emphasize it. So our airstream does something like this. Every note, our breath wants to accent it. And we're still going to play the notes, but it'll come out sounding like this. Kind of while I accent the note, then it fades and I get that mushy air and my tone's not so good. So we have to condition our brain to notice that there's actually no, no strings between my fingers and my lungs. I don't have to change what my lungs are doing just because my fingers move. While my fingers move, I'm doing this. <sighs> Playing one note. So just a really good exercise. Take your first few notes and really see if you can blow that well uh, without changing your air at all. It's harder than it sounds, especially when we get into tonguing. In next Saturday, same time, I'm going to be focusing on articulation. So I'm going to hold off on exercises on that till we get there. But I'll just say getting that fast, steady air can make a huge difference in how we play. And I had mentioned in the write-up I was going to talk about squeaking because that's so frustrating for us. Um, the main causes of squeaking, if I were to, to simplify it, one of them is that biting and typically we'll notice that if it's a hard note for us so if you're squeaking just kind of ask yourself hmm was i biting and if so can i bring my corners in a little bit secondly though um, if our fingers are not covering the holes all the way we can get a, either a squeak or like a, a weird delay and resistance to the note um i play d to c with my fingers in a pretty good position <laughs> If for some reason, and you know, our little third fingers are kind of weak, I didn't quite cover it all the way. The note feels really hard to play and it sounds fuzzy. So looking in a mirror is great. I want to talk more about fingers in two weeks, but just briefly, I like having fingers. If we just make a little hand puppet, like I'm doing right now, that round arch shape is what we want. And we want to train our fingers to hover close to the holes that are going to be like their home button. So this finger, if I train it to stay that close, and I could do it by doing what I'm doing right now. I'm just looking at it and training it to move that way. Then it's going to be way easier to cover those holes. So squeaking can be caused by biting. It can be caused by fingers not covering holes. Those are the main things. And if you're, reed, if you're outgrowing your reed strength, it's a little bit too soft. It will squeak more readily. So sometimes it can be an indication that your reed's getting a little bit too soft. Okay, so this was our express. How do we sort of think about some of the things that set us up to sound good? And I hope you're finding this useful. I wanted to leave a little bit of time to answer questions. So, um, and those of you who joined us late, uh, it's, this is going to be recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again as well. But so nice to, uh, I'm just scanning through the chat to see all of you here. Um, so Marion has a question. Why do some teachers say do not put reeds in water, but only wet with your mouth? So when you have a cane reed, it needs to be wet to vibrate and um, having it wet is what counts. For a lot of people, it's convenient to put it in your mouth and get it wet. That's how I was you know, taught in grade seven. Some people though do believe that um, our saliva slightly digest the reed, it makes it softer and all reeds get softer over time. So they like to wash it off in water or some people use Listerine afterwards. Uh, for me, I don't have a strong preference for how you get it wet, just get it wet. The synthetic reeds don't have to be wet. So they're a little bit um, easier in that sense. Okay, great. So I'm taking a look at the questions and if you have any questions, we still have about five minutes. So feel free to type your questions in. Um, Jennifer's asking, grade four now getting pain in my job. I, I started switching to double lip. Really like the sound I get, although I have not got complete control. Wondered if I have a view on double lip embouchure. Yeah, Jennifer, that is a great question. So I think there's advantages and disadvantages to, to both of our main embouchure types, whether our teeth are on or we're double lip. Double lip is a great embouchure. And if you don't use it, I encourage you to use it some of the time, even as a training exercise. The main reason is I think our top lip is quite sensitive. And if we're someone who tends to chomp and bite too much, 
it'll really hurt when we do it on our top lip. So people with double lip tend to naturally open their jaw more, which allows the reed to vibrate more. And it also with our jaw more open helps us bring those corners in. So often with double lip, we get better, warmer tone. And that's a really lovely thing. Um, and, you know, I, in fact, I remember hearing Ricardo Morales, who's I think one of the world's greatest clarinet players say that he was taught to play with his teeth on. This was some years ago. I don't know if that's still the case with him. And he said, if he were learning again, he would have learned double lip. And he said, he's just, just too hard to change, but he does use it quite a bit as a practice exercise. And he really recommends it to his students. So, um, the only disadvantages I've heard Jessica from people who or Jennifer, sorry, who use it a lot is the mouthpiece is a little bit less anchored. So some people find when they tongue, it's a little less stable. However, given that we should be training our tongues to be really light, that, that doesn't make a difference once you get your tongue lighter. So um, pain in the jaw. I'm not a physician or anything. There's different things that can cause that. Um, sometimes though, it is tension in the jaw. There's that unnatural tension. So you switching to double lip, might help you relax your jaw a bit but beyond that if if now that you've switched to double lip it's still bothering you you might want to talk to a physiotherapist or something if someone here knows something put it in the comments please it can help jennifer but that's a little beyond mine all right alan says i have problems completely covering the tone hole with the left ring finger i said yeah alan's funny it's exactly the example i was using one of the things to check alan is your left wrist position um what we want is for our our forearm, wrist, and hand to try and make a straight line from all angles. So a lot of people tilt their wrist back like this. That makes it really hard for our fingers to get on there. So stand as if you're doing a handshake with your left hand and try and bring that to your clarinet. And that often helps us get that finger in there. So just experiment. And that also means keeping elbows close to your body. Because if, if, my, if my left elbow comes out, now it's bending my wrist, which also will lead to wrist problems, tendonitis and stuff. So Alan, I hope that um, is going to help you, give you some ideas there. All right. Mel is asking, can you please speak about preparing, seasoning a new reed? Yeah, there's lots of different opinions out there. But um, for me, for cane reeds, I think that they get what I call waterlogged really quickly when they're brand new. And what you'll notice when a cane reed's waterlogged is the tip starts to get see-through. So um, I, I went to a workshop at a clarinet fest where people talked about their systems and there were like 25 different systems, all good. So I'll just share mine. Um, day one, I usually only plan on playing a cane read about 10, 15 minutes tops. And then I let it dry out. And the next day I'll play on it about 25 minutes. Day three, about 45 minutes. After that, usually it's good to go. But in my experience, most cane reads still get waterlogged after an hour to an hour and a half. So if you have like a band camp or a retreat weekend where you're going to be playing many hours in a day, make sure you have several reads and you always should have a few reads on the go that you rotate through. Even if you're playing synthetic reads, they kind of like to have that break. So I, I tend to rotate through reads, have a few in my case. Okay. I think I have like about two or three minutes. So I'm going to keep going. Candelie's asking what brand of synthetic reed do I use? I use the Legere European cut. For me, that was the game changer. Shane's asking, what are the disadvantages of synthetic reeds? A great question, Shane. I was really anti-synthetic reeds for a long time. When I experimented with them, I found my pitch was flat. I couldn't quite get the warm sound that I wanted. And for me, um, I'm so grateful. I get to teach uh, with Jose Front Balleste, who's doing a master class this afternoon and a recital today, who's just a phenomenal world-class player. I'm so lucky to be around him. And he said, Michelle, you have to just go synthetic for a whole month and try it and, and you'll make the sound you want eventually. And I did. Uh, it took me a while, but then I found I was able to play more in tune. I was able to get the sound I want. I shifted some things. I'm not sure what. Um, so now for me, at least, you also need to have the right mouthpiece that works with it, you know, just like we do on cane reeds. Not all mouthpieces work well with synthetic reeds, but once I got it working, there's no disadvantage. <laughs> I have reeds that don't warp. They're not fussy. They last a long time. They sound good, but it was a journey. I'll be honest. I was resistant to it and I didn't like the results early on. Um, so Shane, I hope that helps you. 
Uh, okay, we're very close to the end of our session. Um, I'll just see if there is anything quick in the chat that I can answer. But I think uh, I know there's another recital starting very shortly. Okay, yeah, and Bill is asking why do abs out make air stronger faster? I don't know. However, um, I do have a student who's a was a pediatric respiratory specialist, and she actually had some technical way for the way it engages that. And she said, it's good, Michelle, you're right to teach that. So I'd have to ask her for the details. Um, all right. So thank you all so much for coming today. And, and again, thanks to Mary for organizing the clarinet learning commu community. Check the other sessions. I'll be here at the same time the next two weeks. And I think the last week it's an hour earlier, but uh, really appreciate you all showing up. Thank you, everybody. And I really hope to see you at one of our upcoming sessions. Make sure you check out the recitals and concerts that are happening. Um, that's all I have. Jessica, if you have anything else, please let us know. Yep, Otherwise, we're all set. Thank you so much. If you joined late, this session will be up on YouTube later today. So um, we have another recital starting in one minute over on YouTube, the Spotlight Recital Number 2. So be sure to join that, and we'll see you for the masterclass at 3 o'clock. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.